You may be seated. Happy Valentine. This is your only card from me. <laughs> so I will say it again. Happy Valentine. I love each and every one of you. No chocolate. We don't need any of us needed. Amen. Go ahead and watch the video for a moment. You know, last week, a lot of people walked in and said, well, that was an extremely convicting message. That wasn't nothing compared to today. <laughs> because today I'm going to tell you about the things, some of the things that really convict me. And it has to do, you know, on Valentine's Day, we celebrate our relationships and our love and our fellowship. Thank you, sir. It's important we understand that uh, just how important it is that we do express our gratitude and our love for our father as well as for each other. Uh, I shared a story a couple of years ago, or maybe again recently, last year, at one of our marriage retreats about a newspaper columnist and a minister named George Crane who had, uh, had a wife come into his office who was extremely upset with her husband. She's really filled with a lot of hatred towards her husband. And uh, her, her mindset to him was, I, I not only want to get rid of him, I want to get even. I can't stand him. I, can't, I, I, can't, I detest him. He's, he, he's the worst man that anybody could ever be married to. And I want to hurt him as much as he hurt me before I tell him I'm going to divorce him. And he's, uh, he suggested a, a really cl clever plan for her. He said, I'll tell you what, you really want to hurt him. Then uh, for the next couple of months, why don't you go home and just act as though you really are in love with him? I mean, all the things you would do if you were passionately, madly in love with him. You know, do those things. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for everything he does. Find the slightest decent trait. Praise him for that. Be as kind as you can be. Be as considerate as you can be. Be as loving as you be, as generous as you can be. Just spare no efforts in seeking to please him and to make him the happiest. Make him feel like he is the king of the, uh, of the castle. And then, after you have convinced him, of your undying affection and love for him, you just can't live without him, then drop the bomb on him that you want a divorce. With revenge in her eyes, she leaves the office exclaiming, that is the most brilliant plan I've ever heard. And she goes about it for two months. She shows love and kindness. She listens to him. She respects him. She, she reinforces him. She shares with him, you know. Two months go by and she doesn't return, so Dr. Crane decides to give her a call. And he says, Are you ready to go through with the divorce now? To which she responded, divorce? Never. I am madly in love with this guy. I have discovered that I really do love him. I want to talk about the power of love and the power of demonstrating our love and how it not only can affect the change in other people, but what it really does in us. So often when we do our marriage conferences and sermons on relationships and we talk about forgiveness and we talk about showing gratitude or respect or love, and we deal with all these issues, you have to understand at the very bottom, the root of all that is this word love. The root of all that we do is this word love. It's the commitment to care. It's the commitment that goes beyond, you know, what, uh, what we would normally do. And we don't know much of that in this world that we live in. In the 21st century, a, a time that is filled with hatred racism and violence, disgust for other people. You know, we're, we're so far removed from what this word means. Our, our streets are filled with crimes. Our, our homes are filled with the hatred and, and violence. Our, our nation is filled with violence. The world is filled with violence. All, all this is des described in the Bible as being in the last days when it talks about how, how nation against nation and race against race and people against people, that even in their own homes there would be division and strife and hatred. That, that is the, the epitome of what happens. Well, Paul described it this way. In the last days, men shall be lovers of themselves. 
And all that is the fruit of selfishness. Isn't that what James said? In, in James, when he says, you know, where do wars and quarrels and fights come amongst you? He said, don't they come from the fact that you don't get what you want? You want and you don't get, and therefore you war and you fight. Every argument pretty much stems from that in our homes. Every fight you have with your parents come, stems from that. You're not, you're not getting what you want. And because you don't get what you want, there results in this, this attitude of anger and strife. And, you know, we're living in a time when people are more in love with themselves than they are with each other. Now, I said this message is more convicting because if there's anything that cuts to my heart and cuts to the core of my being is when I talk about something like this, because I know it's our nature not to be this kind of person we're talking about in this message. It isn't our selfish nature to be self-centered and self-seeking and let our relationships think that the joy of our relationship comes from getting what I want and being satisfied with the result of what this other person is doing for me. And we don't understand what the Lord is talking about and what the Bible is talking about when it really talks about loving. We all go through times of pressure. We, all go, th we go through difficult times. You may be experiencing a, a difficult time in your family or your finances or in your relationship or your home with your parents. But you know, all those things that, that Christians experience and we do experience them. In this world, you shall have tribulation. Those are the very things that should be. Now, listen carefully. This is important. Those things that you're experiencing right now, those are the things that should be pressing you closer together, not driving you apart. Those are the things that should be shaping and molding you into the one that God designed you to be. Even in a church, it's the same way. The things that churches go through, the ups, the downs, the, the difficult times, the good times, all those things, not just the good times, all those things should be pressing us together. But we're so selfish when we have, begin to have problems with our church or home, where we, we start looking outside. We start looking at another church, another wife, another spouse, a, another, a, another job. Or, or, or it's thinking that somehow that our happiness is dependent on something out there. But the Bible says that when we learn as children of God to walk in the spirit of love, then God does something supernatural. There is a genuine supernatural grace that flows in our lives and through our lives when we begin to practice this biblical love. It's that word agape. We're all familiar with it. It's that word in John 3, 16, for God so loved. It's not, it's not that, that word that God so liked. I heard the story once of, of Peter Schultz. He's the guy who wrote the Peanuts cartoon strip, you know. And Schultz had gone to see a friend of his, and when he got there, the, the guy took his coat and put, it, and put it in a room, and he came back out of the room with a, with a big gold chain, and emblazoned across the bottom of the chain was, uh, in, in big gold letters was L-O-V-E, love. L-O-V-E-Love. And he was showing it to Schultz, and I guess showing it off, whatever it was, and Schultz is kind of looking at it and contemplating it, love. He took the, the emblem, and he looked at it a little bit, and then he handed it back to his friend. He says, that's a little too difficult for me. You got one that says like. <laughs> I think when we really begin to understand what love is and what it means and what it costs, then some of us might think, oh, that's a little too difficult for me. But let me say this. If by chance you've come to the cross, if by grace you've come to the cross, if you are a believer, then the Bible makes it clear in Romans chapter 5 that the love of God, and that's that word agape, that the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. In other words, if you're recreated in Christ Jesus, you're a new person in Jesus Christ, that you have the capacity, the ability to demonstrate the kind of love that we're going to talk about here this morning. And it is a convicting message because when we really get honest and we're really, really willing to peel back the layers of our heart, we begin to see, man, the deepest root problem of our heart and soul is our selfishness. The essence of every sin, every rebellion, all those acts of disobedience really gets back to this fact that we don't know how to love. And then God intervenes and God moves in and interrupts time and space. And the God who describes himself as God is love. He shows up in the form of his son and lives out and personifies what real love is. Even at the cross saying, Father, forgive them. We start getting a hold of that kind of love. It, it gets real convicting. Everything pretty much hinges on this. Paul's writing to the Corinthians, and we'll, we'll go to that famous love chapter. If you've got your Bible, you can go to 1 Corinthians 13, because we're going to look at some verses, not all of them, but some of those verses that talk about what it really means to have this kind of love. And I want to demonstrate, hopefully, in this message, the power of love. 
There really is a power. Usually, a lot of times in our, in our marriage conferences, we're talking about, well, a wife should respect her husband and a husband should love his wife. And we go through steps and procedures and talk about all the dynamics of that and all the facets of what that means and how to express that in our life. But we forget that really the bottom line is pretty simple. You love. You choose to love. You choose to express grace and love and mercy and all these times and all those things demonstrate love. Hadn't got anything to do with our emotions. Paul's writing to the Corinthians. Remember, the Corinthians were a Greek people. The city of Corinth is in Greece. And as he writes to them, the Greeks were very proud of their culture and very proud of what they, their oratory skills and their great, their great philosophers. And remember, Paul's at Mars Hills and he's up there with all the debaters and philosophers and they're all, they were all great skilled orators of the time. And, and he's, he's writing to this church who's come to Jesus Christ and they've made this decision to give their life to Christ. And he's dealing with them about so many things that stem from Christians who choose to live in immaturity instead of to grow in grace. And he, he's, he's confronting them about their carnality and the sin in their life. And then he begins to confront them and to deal with them about the proper theology and proper doctrine and church relationship. In chapters 11 and 12 and then 14 and 15, he's talking about the body relationship and how that we need to understand that we are the body of Christ and we need each other. That we have gifts that God's given us and God's equipped me for you and he's equipped you for me. And we're all here for the kingdom of God. And how that there's this necessity within that God has built into us to need each other and to, to help each other and to grow with each other and to encourage each other. And then right in the middle of all that, remember it's a letter, it's not really chapters and verses when it's in its original content. Right in the middle of all that, he drops these paragraphs, these, these words of love saying that, you know, it's really... Though you can prophesy and you, you can express these spiritual gifts, if it, you don't have love, then you're nothing. You might be able to, to understand great biblical truth, but without love, you're nothing. And he's expressing all of these things to the people, who, I guess, who pretty much considered them cultured. Uh, uh, I went to, to Greece with, uh, with our, our international impact. We, we were in a trip at a conference in Bulgaria, and Dr. Nicole's here. Dr. Nicole and Dr. Bullock and I, uh, we, on the way back one year from, from Bulgaria, we decided we'd do a little two-day, three-day extension over to Greece, and we'd rent a car. And the Greeks are, you know, uh, uh, unique people. We, we get there, and we're renting this car. In fact, Mark was reminding me this at a board meeting this last week. Uh, Dr. Bullock, as we're getting this car, he, you know, he, he's kind of a loud kind of guy. Well, he's in heaven being loud now, but he walks up to the guy at the counter and says, Americans. The guy's not impressed. In fact, he does something like this. He said, uh, listen, Americans, while you guys were going, woo, 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 we were cultured. <laughs> you know, so he wasn't impressed with being American. He said, you guys are far behind the scene. There's an arrogance a little bit there, obviously, amen. But this is true that reigns not just in the Greek culture. Look at, you know, even the American mind. It's people in general have a tendency to, to lean towards arrogance more than they do humility and more than they do love. As Paul writes the letter, it's around 149, you know, uh, uh, well, before this, even about 149 years before the letter, the Romans have invaded the Greeks and have taken over the Greeks. In fact, they led many of them into captivity and they took them into slavery and isolation, carried them away. It's now 100 plus years later when Paul is coming, many of the Greeks have come back and they've re-inhabited the cities and Corinth has been rebuilt as, as well in that time. And he, he comes back to this culture that was so, so... Uh, proud of itself and their accomplishments and their great philosophers and Socrates and Plates and the Mostaces and all these guys. And he comes to them saying, hey, that's not the route to go. Humility in Christ and expressing the love of Christ is where real life is going to be found. And he gives them two letters of instruction. And in this letter, nestled right here in chapter 13, amongst all this about church life, church culture, you know, the spiritual gifts and doctrine and theology, it's this important word that he comes to and expresses that no matter how much of this you understand, if you don't have love, then, then you really don't have anything. I went the wrong way with that. Let me punch that one more time. I'm going to talk about the first verses here, what we call the value of love. And as he states it like this, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels and I do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now he's making a reference to the temple worship of the pagan gods that Greek, uh, the Greeks uh, worship. They, they, they have these great temples they built to all these Greek deities and they begin their services with loud gongs and cymbals. And it's just a bunch of noise. And what Paul is saying, all that noise that those pagans do is about what you're doing if you don't have love. 
So they're getting a little bit of an inside kind of a story they can relate to. If I have the gift of prophecy, if I know all the mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to be able to move mountains and I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give my possessions to feed the poor, if I deliver my body to be burned and I do not have love, it profits me nothing. Those are powerful, powerful, powerful words. In other words, you can have all your theology correct. You can do all the things just right. You can be a great orator. You can be a great theologian. You can understand the mysteries that are revealed in the word of God. You can have great, not, you can exercise great faith so as to see God move in great ways. But if you're not a person who is a lover, if you don't understand what it means to live as, as a person filled with love and with grace, then you're nothing. Phil and I grew up with a pastor named J Jim Brown. Jim was, was a great guy, but he always had this statement. He says, you know, without Jesus, you're nothing. He says, you're just zero. He said, in fact, you're not even zero. He says, you're like a zero with the rim knocked off, <laughs> which is nothing. It's hard for us to relate to that kind of nothing. But that's the word that Paul is using in the Greek language. It means meaningless. Your life is mean. All you're doing is meaningless. Your church attendance. I know we Christians, we're good at get, getting lists together and being religious to follow the list. I prayed today. I read my Bible today. I, 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 I left a track for someone today. I, I, I was nice to someone today. I, I, I gave some money away to somebody. I, I contributed to the church. And we make our list. Hey, add it all up without love. You've done nothing. It means nothing. It works for nothing. When you stand before God, it won't show up. It'll be of no value. And that's why I say we can look at last Sunday's sermon and say, that's giving, no, folks, this is the one that convicts me. This is the one that cuts to my heart. This is the one where I have to work the hardest. This is the one where I have to pay attention the most because I am, as you are by nature of the old nature, selfish to the core. This is what destroys our marriages, destroys churches, destroys people, is the fact that we don't understand what it really does mean when Paul said without love, and that is the word agape. There were lots of words in the Greek language, you know, for, for love. There was a family love, which is storge. There was a, there was a brotherly love, which is, is, is philos, which we get the word Philadelphia, city of brotherly love from. There was a, the word eros, which had to do with sexual or sensual, physical love, which we get the word erotic from, erotic from. There are all kinds of words. Now, in our language, we don't have a lot of words like that. We just say, I love you for everything. You know, I love Mexican food. I really do. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking about it right now. In fact, I may go have some fajitas for lunch. I love chips and salsa. Can I get a witness? Yeah. I have told many people that the wedding feast in heaven, it's going to be fajitas and enchiladas. <laughs> I know this, all right? Because <laughs> it wouldn't be heaven without it, would it? <laughs> I love it. I, I you know, I had a dog I loved. A dog, Duke. I love Duke. I miss Duke. I miss my dog. You know, I, I love that dog. I married the most beautiful in the world. I love her. Amen. Hey, doesn't some of that lose its meaning in the context that's the only word I'm using? Well, you love enchiladas too. I'm glad you love your wife. You love a dog. I'm glad you love your wife. But so Paul, by the inspiration and the leadership of the Holy Spirit, is choosing a very special word to say, this is not like all that other stuff. This goes far and well beyond. You need to understand this kind of love. This kind of love is an unselfish choice. This kind of love is a sacrifice. This kind of love, it's described when we make our marriage vows to one another, right? For better, for worse, for richer, for, 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 for poor, for, through sickness and health. There's a lot of people who say those words and say something in line with those words, but when it really gets down to where the so-called rubber meets the road, they don't mean it. This is the kind of love that will change somebody else's life and change your life. This is the kind of word if we could just get a hold of it, what would it do in your family? What, what would this do for, for teenagers and their parents of teenagers said, hey, I'm beginning to understand what real love is. And everything I've demonstrated toward my parents has not been that. Everything I've demonstrated for my parents was, I love you if you do what I ask you to, if you let me do what I want to do, if you let me go where I want to go and stay at this later I want to stay, then you really love me. And we think that's love if they'll let us do what we want. See, that love is based on me and self and self-centered living. If a husband and a wife begin to understand the depth of this love, then it is for better or for worse. We all like better, but we do experience worse sometimes. We all like richer, but we do go through poorer sometimes. 
We all love health, but sometimes it's not healthy. Sometimes it's difficult. And you see that kind of love expressed in those, those people who are experiencing crisis and turmoil and tragedy and the worst that you can experience. And it doesn't drive them apart. It pushes them together. That's the meaning of love. And that takes commitment. That means I'm not going to go live like an idiot because I love my wife. I love my children. I want to live like somebody who leaves a legacy, somebody who, who shows, hey, you can live responsibly, you can live righteously, you can live for Jesus, and it means something. It's, it affects so much of what we do, so much of what we say, so much of how we live our lives. It's a hard word, but it's one that has to be comprehended and held on to. Because without it, it's meaningless. It's of no value. We're com basically, it's basically, you're completely an incapable person without loving without love. Let me just, the, the first is, is, is an understanding is the value of it. The second thing I want to catch is, is the test of love. The, there's several things that are mentioned, even through verse eight and nine that we could read, but he says here, love is patient, love is kind, is not jealous, love does not brag, it's not arrogant. Boy, I watched the debates last night, nobody fit in that category. <laughs> it doesn't brag, it's not arrogant, it doesn't act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked, it does not take into action a wrong suffered, it does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, love believes all things, love hopes all things, love endures all things. Now, first time I read that, I said, well, I must not be loved because I can act unbecomingly and I can seek my own and I'm easily provoked and, you know, I take into account when a wrong's been suffered. That just simply means this. Well, then you're not, you're not living love. There's the sign. There's this acid test. I was going to say, it says, I say I love you. I say I love my mother. I say I love my father. I say I love God. I say I love my church. But if this is the way I'm acting, I don't, I don't love my church. I don't love God. I don't love my mother. So there's this, this kind of a litmus test, so to say, this kind of line that's drawn the sign. So, so to get over that line or to pass the test, it means that, hey, at this point, I'm going to choose not to take into account a wrong done. I'm going to choose not to act this way. I'm going to choose to express kindness. I'm going to, to choose to rejoice in truth. I'm not going to embrace arrogance and pride. I'm going to choose humility. What have you done? You just made a love decision. And that love decision will change you and it will also change those whom you love. That's the power of love. Somehow we forget that when we talk about these Bible things like forgive and care and, 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 and overlook and you know, we, we think that, well, I just got to do that. I guess I've got to do that. No, you need to understand doing that makes a difference. Doing that is powerful. Doing that especially because it's the love of God you're expressing, is supernatural. And God works and moves. As you look down this, there's, there's, there's several more things in here, but you might call them the test of love. But some of these are, are really blended in part, like one and two, we talked about love suffers long. One, one passage says love is patient. There's really two pa parts to that, and that's why I listed it as two, and it's just one word. It's the word macrothumos. And it has, it's a word which means to be even-tempered, to be even-tempered, while enduring trying circumstances. To stay steady, even things are trying to push you away from being steady. Not to be up and down. Happy one moment, angry the next, rageful the next, excited the next, gleeful the moment later, ready to kill somebody in the next breath. This word, it, it says that suffering will come, tragedy's gonna come, problems gonna come, but hey, I will, I will stay consistent. And it has to do, that's, that's the true meaning, not just to suffer through it, but to be patient has to do with that consistent context of, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, I'm going to walk this thing through. There's a lot of people who say, I, I love you. We use that term so lightly, I love you, I love you. But we don't even understand that this, is, this has to do with suffering. This has to do with patience. This has to do with commitment. You know, it's like the guy who runs into his dad to dad, I, I just got to get married. I'm ready to get married. Son, how do you know you're ready to get married? Well, I just, I just know I, I'm, I'm in love. And he said, how do you know you're in love? Oh, man, last night I was with my girlfriend and I was kissing her and her dog bit me. And, you know, I didn't feel any pain till I got home. That's not suffering long. That's not necessarily the expression of true love here. 
I think that's more like hormones <laughs> that kept you from feeling the pain for the moment. But hormones come and go up and down. Emotions change. Love says it doesn't matter what I'm feeling in this moment. I'm going to make this, this, this choice for, for somebody else's higher good and somebody else's highest good to decide to act and to respond in such a way that glorifies God and is an act of love and demonstrates the life of Jesus Christ. This means at this point, I'll take it. And I'm not going to let it move me off course. I'm going to stay consistent. I love this person. I'll demonstrate it now. Because it's, n it's never demonstrated more than when we choose to act in a selfless manner. That, what's that saying? That means I choose to love. Anybody under conviction yet? Beside me? But not always love patient and love is long suffering. He says here that love is kind. I, I like this word. When you start looking at it in Scripture, this word kind has to do with being considerate and gentle and warm hearted, gentle and warm hearted, you know, to someone. It, it's an expression of compassion. It, but it's the same word when I started looking at it closely. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, for it is light. Dumbo says easy. This, that's the same word in the Greek language. That love is, is easy. It's, it, I'm not hard to love is what it should mean. I'm not hard to get along with, what does she mean? I don't have to be tiptoed around because I might be in a certain mood. And, you know, we can be that way. Not you. you quit lying to me. You too, you can be that way. You know, you get your feelings hurt. You get upset about something. Things didn't go well. You had a rough time. You've been sitting at four, four or five o'clock traffic for an hour and a half. You finally cleared the accident. You get off the, and you know, you, you, you know we, we can be testy and temperamental and emotional. So that we, 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 we're not walking in the spirit and we're not definitely not walking in love. He says here, hey, if you love, it's gentle. It's warm. It's compassionate. And so often that's not the expression of our heart in our life. I, it was interesting when I was, I was studying this week, I did look at a couple of commentaries. I, I have quite a few on my computer. So way out, my, my, my process of study is pretty simple. You know, the Lord, I, I get a word the Lord's really speaking to me about and I start developing it and I kind of work out an outline of what I, I think it's saying to make it as communicating as easily as possible. And then after I've kind of prayed over it and worked over it and, you know, let flow out of my heart what's there, then I'll start looking at commentaries and just reading what other pastors and commentators and study notes. And I'll start looking at what would be an exegesis where you break down the words and what they mean and start looking at the, at the words or Hebrew or the Greek, whatever it might mean, and, and I'll place that in the sermon. But as I started looking at this, it was interesting to note that several, several commentaries that were written in, in recent years all mentioned this one article. Uh, I don't know if all these guys were just copying each other. It was just well known at the time. But years ago in, in the Los Angeles Times, it was also repeated in the Chicago Daily News. There was an article that was entitled, Love Working Miracles for the Mentally Ill in Kansas. Let me put it this way. It can work for mentally ill anywhere. But it went on to say, it was an article by well-known, you've probably heard the name before, a uh, globally well-known psychologist, psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Carl Menninger. And he was featured in the article. And Dr. Menninger contended this, that love is the most effective cure in healing mental illnesses. He didn't say pills. He didn't say electroshock or surgery. He didn't say drugs. He didn't say group therapy and group sessions. He said that love is the biggest part, the real secret in resolving these mental illnesses people have. Well, let's think about it. I mean, it's pretty simple. You, as Christians, and we understand in Scripture what it talks about and all the fruit of living a selfish life. And, you know, uh, if you just look in Galatians where it talks about the fruit of the flesh, that the flesh just produces hatred and strife and envy and all these things and anger and despair and depression, you know, all those things that just build up in a, in a person's life uh, usually result because that person's living not a selfless life, but many times a selfish life. We get into an attitude where we think the world revolves around us. We think that everybody owes us something. You owe me this, you owe me. If you really love me, you'd do this for me. If you really cared about it, you wouldn't do that. You know, we have all this stuff, it's just junk. It ain't got anything to do with reality, it hasn't got anything to do with truth. But we put our little self on the shelf out there and, and, and when things don't go our way, we just keep closing in and closing in and closing in and becoming, we get filled with guilt, we get filled with blame, we get filled with despair, we get filled with shame. All this stuff just keeps piling up. And no wonder we have so much mental illness. No wonder our nation is handing out pills like they were M&Ms. 
We have a pill for everything. A pill for every emotional problem. A pill for every mental problem. And nothing ever resolved. Because the bottom line is, until we step out of ourselves and step into the will of God and learn who Jesus is and who, what he means to our life and begin to walk with him and follow him, our life will always be in turned internally and when it's that way there's no life we become that big zero your life is not about just you but that's not the culture today the culture is different what happens when we begin to realize hey I need to be kind because that's real love he went on to say love envies not this is a word which is the word we get the word zealot from it's the word for passion, but this is used in the, in the Greek language with, and written in such a way the form of this word is, is a negative, all right? That this is, this is not the kind of, when it says God is a jealous God, where that means that God is passionate about us. God is filled with mercy for us and love for us. He wants to protect us. He wants to care for us. You know, he wants to watch over us. That's not this, what it's talking about here, because the Bible says love is not jealous. But this is a different word, and it's the word zelo. It's, it's a form of passion, but it's the wrong type. It's that kind of passion that is angry. You want what others have, or you want for yourself what, what they have, or you, you know, you, it's, it's all about kind of back what I said a while ago about, about the world rotating around yourself. The Song of Solomon put this way in chapter 8, verse 6. Solomon said, You know, that jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Sometimes it, it manifests itself an attitude of possessiveness. You're just jealous of everything uh, that, 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 that's going on in somebody else's life. It could even be a jealousy over your spouse. That you think that they're paying too much attention somewhere else or some other place and, or in some other duty or some other aspect. And it's, it's just a, it's a destroyer in any relationship, no matter how it's manifest. It destroys that warmth and obviously the kindness. And it becomes one of those great enemies of what real love is. There's a lot of things. Let me just wrap it up with number five here because these, these five kind of wrap it all up. Love bears all things. This is another word which has to do with the consistency, but what it means is not only are you patient, this is a word which literally means to, to withstand with courage. To stay courageous. To realize that love is courageous. To realize that love is the highest thing. To realize that love is the most important thing here. That, that, that it goes deeper and reaches further than anything else. And so it can take whatever comes down the pike and it can bear whatever that, that life brings or what Satan may throw at you, or what the world may throw at you, what emotions may do. Love will bear those things. Love's gonna push through those things. The Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins. Over and over through the scriptures, Jesus keeps giving us this message about love and love and love and love. And so many people don't understand the context of they think it's something that's cowardly or something that's, that has to intimidate it by, by the world and by things and by people. And you kind of sheepishly fall away. Tell Jesus that as he stands with courage at the cross of the Lord that God has brought him to. And he stands there and he says, not my will, but thy will be done, Father. As he stands there and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Love. Can we embrace that kind of love? That's transforming. Let me get to the last point and we'll close with this. There's, there's, there's two pages of scriptures here on, on, on the overhead. Let me just read to you. It's only about seven or eight verses. Love never fails. Underline that. If there are gifts of prophecy, they'll be done away with. Their tongues, they'll cease. If there's knowledge, it's going to be done away with. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. He goes on to say, when I was a child, <laughs> I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I reasoned as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. It is the child in us that says, I want, give it to me, it's mine, you can't have it. We know in part, but now we don't. We, we, we're coming to the place where we're not going to know in part when we're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, now we just see dimly in the mirror, but then face to face. I know in part, but then I shall know fully, just as I have been fully known. Now, listen, now abides faith, hope, and love. All this other stuff's not going to abide. It's just not going to last. All the things you think that giving you happiness, whether it's people or, or, or money or the world or material items, that's not going to be, you know, it's, it's not going to last. None of, this, none of this around us is going to last. Faith, hope, and charity, that's what you bank on. That's what you invest in. Faith, hope, and charity, that's where you put your life. That's where you send your roots down. That's what you build upon in your life. Those are the things that are important, faith and hope and charity. Love, these three, 
abide. And the greatest of these three, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Verse eight, I mean, Paul makes a pretty rather categorical statement when he says, love never fails. Love won't fail. Well, I just don't know. Well, no, you don't. Because you just know partly. But the one who knows in full knows. And the one who knows in full is the Lord. And the Lord gives us these words. Love doesn't fail. What if it doesn't work? Love doesn't fail. What if it didn't happen? Love doesn't fail. You keep on loving. You keep on walking love. You keep forgiving. You keep being kind. You keep being compassionate. You keep sacrificing. If necessary, it's not going to fail you. And this is, this is something we need to realize. This is the power of love. It is certain to succeed. When everything else fails and all else will fail, this won't. And anybody who chooses to practice this kind of life, to make these kind of love choices and love decisions, you're not going to live in defeat in your life. You may go through difficult situations. Things may appear poorly around you. And they may play some kind of influence in your part in the so-called stage of life. But when the final act is read and played out, faith, hope, and love abide. And love is greater than all of them. There comes a time, I think we have to realize that anytime I'm building my life on me, and what I want, what I think will make me happy, and what's going to make me succeed, and what's going to progress my agenda, it's all just sinking sand. You want to change your life today? You want to change your marriage today? You want to change your relationship with your parents today? You want to change your world today? Walk in love. Walk in love. And the only way to do that is when we deny ourselves and we take up the cross and we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there's no power in our self and there's no power in our flesh. It has to come from God. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Romans 5. Praise God for that agape love that's bigger and greater and stronger than all these other things. Let's stand with our heads bowed.